this is a completely different room arrangement um, because in a little bit we'll be doing a hands-on activity and we wanted everybody to have tables but and I recognize you're turning in your seat that's a little different so I apologize for that although I have to say I have loved watching all the conversation that has gone on across tables when you're not looking at somebody's back that's that's really lovely so welcome to our last night of this year's biotech 201 uh, boo yeah yeah no wig today just a vintage 1950s polyester taking us back to artificial fibers 1950s polyester outfit great from the um, from fantasy playhouse just lots and lots of fun uh, let me just stop before we actually get started and welcome all of you here welcome everybody that's watching um, from home or streaming and let me say just a special word of thanks to the folks that have actually made this month really work so I, I want to say a special thanks to the Ashburn Foundation, our premier sponsor, our underwriting sponsor. But I also want to acknowledge our in-kind sponsors, the Jackson Center, um, Orange Beard for all of the filming, and Fantasy Playhouse for the fantastic costumes. We would not have been able to do this without all of those groups. And we are so, so very appreciative. I also, yes. I also want to say a word of thanks to the spectacular volunteers who every Tuesday night have come to check you in, to make sure that to, hand, to give you handouts, to put materials into your hands. Um, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you. And then I want to say a special word of thank you to the education outreach team. Um, I have pushed my team uh, in very uh, significant ways this month. Uh, all of the materials that you've had, the tastings, all the things that you've tried, uh, the fact that we uh, have made molecules every single week, the team has been wrapping balloons with glue-soaked yarn week in and week out. And it, it has just been so fantastic to have their support, whether they were prepping or they've been here each Tuesday night helping hand out or pick up things or they've been monitoring the online chat. I just want to say how much I appreciate that. And I want to give a special shout out to Stacy Brewer, my executive admin, who has led that whole uh, And then lastly, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for, for being willing to step into a month where we talk about biochemistry. That is not necessarily something that you know, 300 people make a four Tuesday night commitment to do, and I appreciate that very, very much. And I also want to thank all of you who have supported us, your words of encouragement, the notes that you've sent us, the snacks that you've brought us, the financial gifts that you've given us, the, the donations that you gave during, um, during the earlier weeks, um, and those of you that are Alumni Association members. I, I really appreciate that. Um, many of you in this room are Alumni Association members. You, you pay a, a modest, um, a, an annual uh, fee, and then you have access to a night in the fall where we unveil the new guidebook, and a night in, a night in the spring where, a night in the spring, it's the polyester. The polyester is causing all kinds of problems. A night in the spring where we cover um, new findings. And so for those of you that are alumni association members, and if you'd like to become an alumni member, there's information on the very last page of your handout. And for those of you that have given this month as part of this proposal, as part of the week two, um, if you have given at the alumni level, so $50 or above, you are now incorporated into the Alumni Association as well. But I'm going to give a presentation on Thursday the 26th, uh, and we're going to talk about the coronavirus outbreak. So we're going to dig into the coronavirus and all the conspiracy theories around the coronavirus and where's the truth and what is fiction. So that'll be Thursday, March 26th. Um, Stacy, am I correct? Everybody who is an alumni member is going to get an email with a link to register. Um, if you are becoming an alumni member tonight, the form includes a link, a box for you to check. But if you're already an alumni association member, you don't need to check this box and hand it in, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's jump in. It's 1950 and it's 
It's England. So we're going to spend time tonight in labs. We're specifically going to spend time tonight in two labs, in King's College and at Cambridge. And I want to introduce you to these four individuals. And before I get started, many of you probably already know some things about some of these individuals. And many of you think that you know some things about some of these individuals. These individuals are colorful characters, to say the least. And some of these individuals have had a lot of things written, written about them. And some of the things that they have had written about them um, have been slanted to fit one of multiple agendas. So I'm going to work to try to give you a straight narrative that is not necessarily the narrative that you may have read or that you may have grown up hearing. So let's get started. We're going to start with Rosalind Franklin, this woman here. Rosalind was a chemist and an x-ray an x-ray crystallographer. Rosalind got her undergraduate and her PhD degree from Cambridge, worked in Britain on understanding coal and graphite and different structures of coal as part of the war effort, and then went to France for three years. And in France, she learned a technique called x-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is going to be important for our story. Essentially, if you take a molecule and you bombard it with x-rays and you put x-ray film around it, the x-rays will go straight until they hit one of the chemicals, one of the atoms in the molecule, and they'll veer off at specific angles depending on what they hit. So they then veer off and they hit the film, and you can develop the film and you get an image. And based on the pattern of scatter on the film, you can begin to learn something about the structure of the molecule. So this was a way in the late 40s and in the 50s and 60s that we used to better understand the structure of things when we didn't really understand what was going on at the molecular level. So Rosalind Franklin learned x-ray crystallography. And she received the opportunity in 1951, I think, to take a three-year fellowship to King's College in England. And she was supposed to study, use x-ray crystallography to study proteins. But before she came on board, her boss sent her a letter. I was about to say an email. Her boss sent her a letter. <laughs> and that letter said, we are going to shift from having you work on x-ray crystallography on proteins to x-ray crystallography on DNA. Because we are having some really exciting findings and we would like you to step in. The letter went on to say that she would run the lab, she would run the unit, and that she would have a graduate student, and that she would have a brand new machine ready for her. That brings me, that brings me to this man, Maurice Wilkins. Maurice Wilkins also worked at King's College. Now, Maurice was an older individual. He had his degree, his PhD in physics. And during 1944 and 1945, he was part of the team that came from Britain to the United States and to the United States, and he worked on the Manhattan Project. And so that was the work that he did. And then when that wrapped, when the bomb dropped, he came back to Britain and he shifted from physics, from physics, you know. Hey, Mr. Brewer, if you can hear me, I think maybe I'm going to need a handheld mic. We'll, we'll, we'll try that. He shifted from physics to biology. And he began working on x-ray crystallography, specifically x-ray crystallography of DNA. He recognized that they did not have the right equipment at King's College. So he ordered a brand new x-ray machine and all the equipment. He had beautiful. Uh, samples of DNA that he could work with, that, had, that he could form, that he could crystallize, that he could use the x-ray crystallography machine on. He went on, oh, and he also recommended to his boss that Rosalind Franklin, who he knew was coming, that she actually be moved from proteins to DNA and that they work together as colleagues. You hear the difference here? He went on holiday. While he was on the Christmas holiday, Rosalind came in. Rosalind was given the machine that Maurice had purchased. Rosalind was given the graduate student that was Maurice's graduate student. 
And Rosalind was put in sole charge of X-ray crystallography for DNA. Maurice came back from holiday expecting to find a colleague and found someone that had completely replaced him. <laughs> and it was not until years later, years later, that he learned of the letter that his boss had sent Rosalind explaining the shift. So he had no idea that that was the reality. All right, let's try this. He had no idea that that was the reality of what they were dealing with. So he had blamed Rosalind for this, and his boss did not have the conversation about the real storyline. Rosalind was um, a direct woman. She looked you in the eye. She relished a good debate over the data. She could argue like nobody's business. Maurice would not look anyone in the eye, hated conflict, and was much more cerebral in his head. As you might imagine, these two individuals that could have been phenomenal colleagues became adversaries and essentially ignored each other for the entire window of time. That then brings us to Cambridge and the Cavendish lab, a biophysics lab. And let's talk about this gentleman. This is a young American. He is 23 by the time he has his PhD. So he gets his PhD earlier than lots of people in America and he comes to Europe and he doesn't have a very good first postdoctoral experience in Copenhagen, but he goes to a talk by Maurice Wilkins where he hears Maurice, pre-Rosalind Franklin, talking about their work. And he says, this is the field that I want to work in. So he ends up in the Cavendish lab in Cambridge where he meets this gentleman right here, Francis Crick. Francis is still working on his PhD and is 12 years older than Jim Watson. He started on his PhD, the war happened in Britain, the lab that all of his work was in was bombed, the project, in, the project was disrupted, he be, was tran transitioned over and began working on acoustic mine development for the war effort, and then after the war, shifted from physics into biology to begin to get his PhD. So Francis and and Jim, James, became immediate comrades and chums, and they loved to talk, and they were incredibly um, warm with each other, and they actually um, were some of the loudest talkers, so they were given their own office, um, away from everybody else. And even though the structure of DNA was not what either of them were supposed to be working on, they were fascinated with the idea, and they wondered if they could build models which was still relatively new, the concept of building models based on accumulating data from lots of other people. So they started building models. One of the first models they built, they actually invited Rosalind Franklin to come and see it because Jim had been in a seminar that Rosalind had given and had only been half paying attention and came back and told Francis a whole bunch of data from Rosalind's seminar, much of which was wrong, and they built a DNA model based on this, and they showed it to Rosalind, and in Rosalind's way, she said, this is completely wrong, and here's all the reasons why this is wrong and why this would never work to begin with, and this all was said in front of their bosses. So, Watson and Crick were forbidden from working on DNA models because the entire lab was embarrassed, um, Rosalind and Maurice continue to do their work, um, completely ignoring each other, each feeling very frustrated with the other. Rosalind ultimately asks if she can be transferred to another university, if she can take her fellowship and leave because she was just so very unhappy. So she says that she's going to leave and the boss says, okay, fine, we can make that happen, but all of your data now comes back to us. So all of her data, all the photographs, the x-ray crystallography that she takes all come back. And who do you imagine that they all go to? Maurice. The graduate student, back to Maurice. All of these things. At the same time, in America, this gentleman, this is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, also a Nobel Award winner, built models and had, do you remember when we talked about alpha helices, when we talked about wool? 
he built a model of the first alpha helix. So he was a model builder. He started building models of DNA. He actually made a mistake with his first model. He made the same mistake Watson and Crick had made a couple of years earlier. But everyone began to realize it would not be long before Linus Pauling would, begin, would land on the right model. And the British did not want to lose to the Americans. So Watson and Crick were given permission to begin building models again and to begin working with the researchers at King's College, which meant not Rosalind, who was still there but was wrapping her work up, but Maurice. Jim Watson, uh, who was a bit arrogant, is anyway, uh, and a bit bumbling, uh, took the train to King's College and rushed into Rosalind's lab with a copy of Linus Pauling's paper, the one that was wrong, and started telling her how they needed to work together to beat Linus at finding the model. And he may have implied that she didn't know how to read any of her own data, and that he did. <laughs> how to win friends and influence people. And so she got angry, and so he backed away. In his book, he says he backed away because he was afraid that she would strike him. He's like much, much larger than she is. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole set of dynamics and sexism and life in the 1950s if you were a woman in science. But he bumped into Maurice, who had come to see what the commotion was. And so they stepped away, and Watson was telling him how frustrated he was, and Maurice was talking about how frustrated he was as well. And then Maurice happened to show Jim Watson. Maurice Wilkins showed Jim Watson this picture that Rosalind Franklin had taken more than a year or almost a year earlier. This is an x-ray crystallography of a beautiful sample of DNA. Jim Watson, when he saw this, immediately knew what this meant and knew the implications. This suggests, this says that DNA is a helical structure. He looked at the data. Now the data had been given back to Maurice, but at no point in time did they have any conversation with Rosalind just down the hall about this being her data and that it was being shared. On the train back, Jim Watson draws it out on a newspaper and gives it to um, Francis Crick and they begin building the model, but they realize there's more data that they need that they don't quite have that they think Rosalind Franklin probably has. So they, uh, King's College and Cavendish are all part of a larger organization that had to put a publication together showing all the work that was being done. It was called the MRC Report, and they got a copy of it from their boss, Watson and Crick got a copy of it from their boss that included preliminary data that Rosalind Franklin had explained about her work. And using that preliminary data, they then built the calculations to get a better sense of the shape and the size of the model. Now there were some key pieces that they didn't get from her data that truly came from themselves, the way that the bases pair on the inside, the specific A pairing with T and G pairing with C and all of those pieces, that was pure, that was their own but much of the concept of the model was built on data that they were given from Rosalind Franklin without Rosalind necessarily knowing that it was given to them. Now, one narrative that you will read is that they stole the data from Rosalind Franklin. They did not steal the data. Maurice Wilkins showed them the picture. The data that she had published in the MRC report was available for anybody who was within the group but they didn't have any conversation with her about the use of her data. So when they brought her to see the model, and she said, yep, this matches all my calculations, this must be the model, she had no clue that part of the reason why it matched her calculations was because it was partially built on her calculations. So a decision was made that Watson and Crick and Wilkins and Franklin would each publish their work, their experimental work, Watson and, and Crick's model that they're proposing, and then the experimental work of Wilkins and the experimental work of Franklin, back to back to back in the same issue of Nature. And here that is, Here's what, here are those papers. And in it, Watson and Crick acknowledged the support that they got from a general understanding of the work of Wilkins and Franklin. 
They later acknowledged that they would not have been able to put this together had it not been for the work of Franklin. Now here's the challenge. Remember I told you about that, that seminar that Rosalind Franklin gave where Watson, Jim Watson was not really paying that much attention? If he had been paying attention, she gave all the data in that seminar that they would have needed and they would have solved the DNA structure 18 months earlier. Rosalind goes to another lab. She ends up working on virus. She becomes quite famous in her own right for her work on virus. She develops ovarian cancer and dies um, at, a relatively, at a relatively young age. I think she was only at this other lab for maybe seven or eight years. I'm not 100% certain. The 1962 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was then awarded to Watson, Crick, and Wilkins for their work. The Nobel traditionally does not award a prize to more than three individuals. And a few years after this, the Nobel made the decision that they would not award prizes posthumously. But at this point in time, they could have still awarded the prize posthumously, but because they only award it to three people, Rosalind Franklin is the unnamed individual. Now, a lot of people have suggested that really the better way to do this would have to have given Watson and Crick the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine and to give Franklin and Wilkins the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the same year. But regardless, there's the storyline around the race for the double helix. And the challenge when people don't work together, when their personalities get in the way, and there were multiple personalities in the way of this entire narrative, and when there isn't necessarily a willingness to share the data, but also to say, hey, I have this data, would you confirm this, and would you be a part of, of the credit for this? So, there's our history piece, 1950s England, lots of storylines and narratives going on around this. So let's talk about nucleic acids, the last of our four macromolecules. Nucleic acids store, transmit, and transmit hereditary information. They are the vehicle that moves our genetic information from one generation to the next. There are two types, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid. DNA is what you inherit from your parents in your chromosomes. RNA is a messenger, a temporary carrier molecule that carries the information. We'll make that a little bit more clear in just a second. And just like the other weeks we've been talking about, nucleic acids are polymers. So they are made up of repeating units of information. So remember, amino acids are the polymer that makes up proteins, and um, uh, sugars are the repeating unit that make up carbohydrates. Nucleotides are the repeating unit that make up nucleic acids. So here's our structure. So I have a phosphate group. So there's a phosphate, a phosphorus, and four oxygens. Here is a sugar. It's, um, it's a pentose. Sugar, one carbon, two, three, four, five carbon sugar. And then this is a nitrogenous base. And it's a nitrogenous base because it's got nitrogens in it. Those are our ends, and there are different structures. Here's the three-dimensional structure, the ball and stick model. And over here is the actual, is our um, yarn-wrapped balloon model. So let me pull this over just a second. Okay, so here's our phosphate group, phosphorus and our four oxygens. Here's our sugar, one, two, three, four, five carbons. And here's our nitrogenous base, one nitrogen, another nitrogen, more carbons and oxygens. So this is the biggest molecule that we've had each week. And this is one, this is the thymine, this is the T, when we talk about A's, T's, C's, and G's, this is the structure of the T. So it is a large molecule. Um, it took up all the space that we had on our, on our rack. 
There are four different nitrogenous bases in DNA. And here they are. And you can see that for every single one of them, the phosphate group and the sugar are the same. It's the nitrogenous base that's different. And you can also see that some of them are large and some of them are a little bit smaller, but they're all ringed structures. So the carbons and the nitrogens and the oxygens all connect to each other and form one or two rings. Now, just for simplicity's sake, I've just drawn out, I've shaded in the phosphates in yellow, the sugars in green, and in blue, I've got the nitrogenous bases. So here's how those actually assemble in the DNA molecule. So on the outside, you've got a repeating backbone. So here is one unit, here's another, here's another, and here's another. And they connect, the sugar phosphate groups connect. So you have what's called the sugar phosphate backbone. And then you've got your nitrogenous bases facing inward. DNA is a double-stranded molecule, so you've got two of those. And you can see that they're actually running in opposite directions. One of them is the, the, the easy way to look at it is the, is the shapes. One of them looks, goes this way, whoops, one of them goes this way. And then they are held together by your friend and mine, hydrogen bonds. We have talked about hydrogen bonds every single week. They are an important component of linking together every single one of the macromolecules of life that we've talked about. And they link together in a certain way. So the A's always link to the T's and the G's always link to the C's. And so when we think about DNA as a twisted ladder, the outside edges are the sugars and phosphates and the inside rungs are the A's and T's and the C's and G's. Everybody with me on that? And as I said, the two ends, the two sides, they run in opposite directions. It's called anti-parallel. So here is the, all of the, the ball and stick model of a piece of DNA. Here, right here, are the adenines and thymines and the cytosines and guanines in the center. And then here, along the outside, are the sugar phosphate backbones. There are three billion of these in one copy of your DNA and my DNA. Three billion ATGC pairs. And we have a copy from mom and a copy from dad, so we've actually got six billion pairs of DNA of these nucleotides. Okay, so let's put all of this together. Here's our cell. Many of you may have remember seeing, have seen this in Biotech 101. Here's our cell. We're going to spend our time right here in this purple spot in the nucleus. And these strands inside the nucleus, this is your DNA. Now the model of the way that this is shaped is not perfect. It does not look like a bowl of spaghetti in here. Half of the DNA though you inherit from mom, half the DNA you inherit from dad, and here is that classic double helix shape. And just to make it easier to see, we've just cartooned it and we've unwound the ladder. And so you can see that we've got our four, I've false colored them, but our four different nucleotides. I'm going to take half of the ladder off, and you can see that we've got our adenines, our A's, our thymines, our cytosines, and our guanines. And it's the order of these letters on that DNA chain that provides meaning. So the specific A, C, T, G, A, C, T is the recipe that provides instructions to our cells for how to make proteins. So there are about 20,000 of these recipes. You've heard me talk about this a lot. These are our genes. They include things like insulin or hemoglobin or collagen. These recipes may be a thousand letters long. They may be millions of letters long, but it's the specific bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's that provides the meaning in our DNA. So here's a cell. Here's one of our chromosomes. That's the way your DNA is packaged. It's tightly wound. If I unwind it, here's my double helix, and here are my A's and T's that form one rung, and my G's and C's that form another rung. If this looks familiar to you, we did this the very first week of Biotech 101. I know for some of you that's been a while ago, 
but it's the basic building block of how this works. And the order provides meaning. So you've seen me use this analogy before. Here are four letters in our, in our English alphabet, M-E-A-T. That provides meaning to us. I can shift the order of those letters around and give you a completely different meaning or give you gibberish, like the word at the end. The same is true with our DNA. A-A-T-C-G-G -G is different from A-T-T-C-G-G. -G. I gave you one letter difference, but that difference changes the meaning of the instruction. And your DNA is a code. It is the recipe that tells your body how to make things. And what it tells your body how to make are proteins. And those proteins are made of amino acids. So when we talked about proteins two weeks ago, we talked about that proteins were built from amino acids. The order of the amino acids that builds that protein is determined by the order of the letters in the DNA. All right, now let me talk just quickly, and then we're gonna to go to break. Let me talk about RNA for just a minute. RNA is ribose nucleic acid instead of deoxyribose nucleic acid. DNA is double-stranded. We talked about that twisted helix. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. It is a copy made from one side of the DNA. It's a temporary copy of the instructions. Instead of the sugar with deoxyribose, where I just have a hydrogen here, the sugar in RNA is ribose. It has an oxygen in addition to it. it's an OH. So there's so one difference, it's RNA is single-stranded. Another difference, it uses ribose sugar, a slightly different sugar. And then the last difference, instead of ATCG, RNA uses AU. CG. So instead of thymine, it uses uracil. So RNA is also a nucleic acid. It is a lot, a lot like DNA. In fact, scientists hypothesize that the first nucleic acid on Earth was probably RNA. We lived in an RNA-based world until a more permanent double-stranded DNA structure uh, arose. We are not going to have time to get into that. So if that just kind of makes your head go boom, then you can just, just let it go. Don't, don't worry about that. So here's the key, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually jump us to the next slide, which is I think the slide that uh, you've got here, just to keep, it, keep us on time so that we can get our DNA extraction in. Here's your double-stranded DNA. Here are your A's paired with T's and your C's paired with G's. The cell makes a copy of one of these strands. So the DNA unzips, the latter unzips, and we use one strand as the copy. So a T here becomes an A in our RNA copy. An A would become a T in DNA, but in RNA we're using a U. The C the copy is the G, it's the complement of those pairs. So we make our RNA copy, our single-stranded RNA copy, and then inside, outside the nucleus, inside the rest of the cell in the cytoplasm, this RNA meets a protein-making machine called the ribosome, where it's read in three-letter units. And each three-letter unit tells the, cell, tells the ribosome to grab a specific amino acid and assemble them together. So the double-stranded DNA stays in the nucleus. A copy of it is made into RNA that leaves the nucleus and out in the cell it meets a ribosome where it provides the instructions for how we string amino acids together to make our final protein. So DNA, RNA, protein. That's the flow of information inside your cells. Mark. For the, for the, the three-letter code? Um, it, it does, except that the code is what's called, um, it's redundant and degenerate, so there aren't 64 different amino acids. There are only, there are like 20 different amino acids. So you've got the same three, you've got different three-letter codes that actually provide instructions for the same amino acid. Yeah, so it's, it's a, it, it is not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation. It's a great question. Okay. 
we're going to take a break after I do this last slide. I've talked to you about a form of RNA called messenger RNA because it is the messenger, it carries the DNA message out into the cell where it is used to build the amino acids, to build the protein. But there are other forms of RNA as well. In fact, the ribosome that I told you that meets the messenger RNA and makes the protein is actually made up of RNA as well. And then there are other RNAs called transfer RNAs. We're not going to get into that. The point is there are multiple different functions for RNA. There's a whole bunch of other RNAs that we're not even going to touch on, touch on. But the concept, RNA is a single-stranded copy of a part of the double-stranded message. Okay, that's a lot of information in a really short period of time. Here's what I want us to focus on. DNA is the code. It provides the instructions that tells your body how to make the proteins that you need to carry out life. We're gonna take a full 15 minute break. We're gonna, when you come back, you're gonna find a bunch of stuff on all the tables. I'm gonna ask you not to start opening and playing with it until I tell you what to do. But we're gonna extract DNA and tie together all four of the week's stories in that activity. So 15 minute break. Hudson Alpha has an app. It's a free app called iCell, I-C-E-L-L. -L. It's a free download on the Google platform and on the Apple platform. And it is a, it's a way for you to actually take a look at the three-dimensional structure of plant and animal and bacterial cells. And so some of the things that we'll be talking about in just a minute, if you want to dig a little deeper into them, iCell is a great way to do that. It's a free app, as I said. It's been downloaded about four million times around the world. Um, and it's just an easy way to talk about the three-dimensional structure of what goes on in cells. So Emily, thank you very much for that, for that reminder. OK, we are now going to do an activity that ties together everything that we have talked about in the last four weeks. And that is that we're going to extract DNA from strawberries. And some of you in this room, many of you in this room, have extracted DNA from strawberries before. I recognize that. But perhaps not with an eye towards the specific molecules of life that we've been talking about for the last month. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this in an ordered set of instructions. Don't jump ahead. Don't bother your neighbor's extraction. You are responsible for your own science, not anybody else's. And I'll also say, I've never done this with 300 people. Um, so, so we're going to work through this together. If you, if you are missing something when I talk about it, raise your hand and we will get you the piece that you are missing. OK. The first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to take everything out of your bag and put it on the table in front of you. And then I'm going to walk through all the pieces. Okay. All right. The big bag, and those of you that are watching from home, if you've got DNA extraction kits, I know that our students at Bob Jones and our folks at Magnolia Trace came and got a whole bunch of kits, and I know several other folks did as well. Take everything out of your bag. Now, if you are missing something, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. Um, we'll figure out how to make that work later. The big bag is your trash bag. So when I tell you to put stuff in the trash, you're going to put things into the big bag. You should have a small bag, a small Ziploc bag. You should have a stick. OK. Boys, put the stick to the side. The stick is not to poke anybody with. The stick does not go behind your ear. Just set the stick down. I will tell you when to use the stick. All right. You should have a high-tech filtration device, a clear plastic cup, a coffee filter, and a rubber band. You should have a small tube. You're going to take your DNA home with you, if you would like, in your small tube. And you should have a vial of mystery liquid, which we will talk about in just a second. Please do not shake the vial. OK, here's the other thing. There are, at the ends of the tables, there are containers of strawberries 
and there are containers of mystery tubes of liquid. I'm going to ask you to leave the mystery tube of liquid in the container for a moment, but I'm going to ask you to pass the strawberries to the table that you are at and the table next to you. Those of you that are at these four tables right here, in the middle of the table, there's a set of supplies just for your center table. But for those of you that are on the ends, if you'll take the strawberry, take one strawberry, put it in your little bag and pass it on and just pass it to the people at the table that you're at and the table next to you. So everybody grab a strawberry, put it in your small Ziploc bag. Okay, I need a small stick and a small bag. And a small, you have an extra bag, okay. Stacy, I think we've got everything, that, I think in one bag you should have everything that we need. Okay. All right, so everybody needs to take the strawberry and put it into their small bag and seal the bag up. Okay, seal up the bag. No, you can leave the green on. It's fine to, put, it's fine to leave the green on. Okay, there are five steps that we're gonna go through to extract this, the DNA from this strawberry. This strawberry is, con contains millions of cells and each of those cells contains DNA. We are going to get that DNA out. So our first step is fragmentation. Now before you do anything, please hear me. So the first thing that we need to do, I don't know if you remember we talked about this last week when we talked about carbohydrates. The outer wall of plant cells is composed of something called cellulose. Remember that's those repeating units of glucose. Carbon fi uh, cotton fibers are made of cellulose as well. So cellulose provides a rigid structure around the outside of our cells. It makes cell walls in plants. Humans don't have cell walls that are made of cellulose. Plants do, but we've got to break through that. So in just a minute, we're going to mash up the strawberry. And that process of mashing up the strawberry breaks open these cellulose, these carbohydrate walls, so that we can release the cell inside so that we can then work on it. Now, here's a tip. This is not the time for you to smash your hand on the strawberry because you and your neighbor will end up wearing it. So you are just using your hands, just mashing it up. This is a great moment in stress relaxation, stress release. If you can't mash up the leaves in the core of the strawberry, that's fine. If you can't mash up all the strawberry, that's fine too. Just mash it up. I would actually do this with both hands, but I'm holding a microphone in one of them. So just, you want this to be as liquid-like as it can be. And what you are doing is you are breaking apart the cells and you are breaking open the cell wall so we can get to the cell inside. Okay, okay, next step. So we fragmented. Now the next thing that we need to do is lysis. To lyse something means to break it open. So when you think of Lysol, Lysol does its job by killing bacteria and viruses by breaking them open, by breaking open the, the virus or the bacterial particle. Um, so your cell membrane, so we've gotten rid of the cell wall, now your cell membrane, the skin around your cells, in week one we talked about something called a lipid bilayer. The lipids are the fats, and we talked about that your cell membranes are made up of two repeats of lipids. So one set of lipids that has the tails that point down and one set of lipids with the tails that point up. And this membrane, this bilayer, surrounds your cells. It also surrounds the nucleus where your DNA is. So we've got to get rid of our fats. We've got to get rid of the lipids. So what you're going to do at this moment 
When I tell you to is you're gonna open when I tell you to, you're gonna open up your bag, you're gonna unscrew the top on your little container, and you're gonna pour the little container into your bag, zip it back up, and then you're just gonna mix it around. So go on ahead, pour the little container into your bag, zip it back up. I will tell you the little container's contents in just a second. All right, you do not want to shake the bag, but you just want to mix it gently. Now, unlike in previous weeks, this week we are not eating the science. So please do not put any of this in your mouth. Okay, here's what is in our liquid, our container. This is called our lysis buffer. It could not be more simple. For every cup of water, there is a tablespoon of dishwashing liquid and a teaspoon of salt. So this buffer contains cheap soap, I mean the cheapest soap that we can find, dishwashing liquid, and some salt. Do you remember when we talked about fats and we talked about how you get fats off of your hands? You use soap. So here's what's actually happening right now inside the contents of your bag. Here's the membrane around all of those strawberry cells. Remember, you broke open the cellulose cell wall. Now you've got the membrane. That membrane is made of fats. The soap, which is this blue sphere, actually integrates in to the lipids, pulls them into its sphere, and gouges holes in the membranes of your cells. So you are poking holes in the membrane of our strawberry cell and pulling out those lipids, that lipid bilayer, so that you now have a hole that the contents of your cell can leak out, because we need to be able to get into the cell, and we need to get into the nucleus as well. So right now, you are lysing those cells. You are breaking open those cell membranes. I love this activity. We probably, I don't know, we, team, we've probably done thousands and thousands of DNA extractions um, in the 13 years that we've been at the Institute. But I love this activity because it takes something so mysterious as DNA and using things that you probably have in your kitchen or in your medicine cabinet suddenly makes them visible. And at the heart of it, it's all chemistry, but it's chemistry using everyday molecules, everyday materials. Okay. This is one of the two most challenging parts of our entire activity. <laughs> and I will tell you that the 13-year-olds that I do this activity with generally do better than the adults, okay? So I've thrown down the challenge, all right? If you want to work with a partner and do their kit and then do your kit, you can do that as well. But I need you to listen to me all the way through. So those of you that are sitting next to someone who's already started moving ahead, just gently nudge them and say, hey, wait, wait, just pay attention. <laughs> pay attention. Okay. So what we are going to try to do when I tell you is you are going to pour the bag, the contents of the bag. Some of you have already opened your bag. <laughs> you are going to pour the contents of your bag into your filtration system, okay? Now, let me give you some tips for ways to do this. You have a table tonight for a reason. It is for this moment. Please do not put your cup at the very edge of your table. Please do not put your cup partially underneath a bag or something else. Make sure that it is steady in the center of your table. When I tell you to, and you open up your bag, you are going to open the bag, and then you're going to pour it above the cup, into the cup. All right, so open the bag. Not yet. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Jennifer. Make sure that there is an indentation 
in your coffee filter. Excellent point, Jennifer. Thank you very much, or we will be wearing the science. Okay, so when I tell you to, and I have not yet told you to, you will open the bag and you will pour it in, and then I need you to lift the bag up and away from the cup. I need you to lift it up and away from the cup. I need you to lift it because if you don't do that, you will knock the cup into your lap. So, this is the moment. Go on ahead, open your bags, gently pour the content in, lift it up and away, and then your empty bag can go in the trash bag. This is so much fun to watch. I just love this. Okay, so we're gonna let this filter for a few minutes. You do not need to tap on it. Please do not use the stick to poke it. Please do not use, the, this is not stick time. Leave, leave the stick alone. We're gonna let this filter through a second and here's what's going on now. So you know, I also, I told you we use soap and we used salt. The salt's gonna come in handy in two places. One of them is right now, the salt actually helps clump the proteins together. It helps coagulate the proteins and our coffee filter begins to filter out some of those. Now it certainly is not filtering out everything. I told you this is not high tech, but we are clumping out the debris of the cell and what's passing through is the liquid. And the liquid, which contains the liquid inside your cells, the majority of your cell is a water-based, it's the cytoplasm is really liquid-based. The DNA is in that as well. Um, and, and our salt, which is helping clump our proteins, we'll use our salt again in just a second as well, and some of our soap. So we're just gonna let it filter through. Um, we're gonna have a lot of DNA in the filtrate, in the liquid, at the bottom. This is gonna take a, a few minutes, so this is a great time for me to pause and ask questions, because I know it was like a fire hydrant of content over you. We were talking about these four people who don't get along really well and who then get a Nobel Prize, and then boom, 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 there we go with all the science. So, questions from the audience. Ooh, great question. What causes the DNA to form the double helix? So, the, the shape that, I've shown this to you in a flat plane. That is not really the way that atoms link to each other. They link in a position that gives them the most stability where they are the maximum distance from each other. And so this actually has more like a, a little bit like a twist to it along the sugar phosphate backbone and then the nucleotide, the, um, the nitrogen base kind of sticks out into the center. So as you build that, and then as you hydrogen bond the pieces together, the double helix is the most stable shape that it assumes. Great question. Yes, Julie, and then I'll come right over here. What's the, the machinery now that's the, you know, 15 millionth generation of that crystal technology the X-ray crystallography? Yeah, what are they using now to show? They the still do X-ray crystallography. Really? Yeah, so it's advanced, and we're now way at the end of my knowledge, but X-ray crystallography is still a thriving field to be able to visualize the structure of proteins. Now, some of that has begun to be replaced with computer modeling, where you know when you have this set of atoms, they generally form this kind of shape, but there are still a lot of folks that do X-ray crystallography. Gary, I'll come to you in just a second. How close are we getting to using crystal technology on, on humans? 
Ooh, how close are we to using CRISPR technology on a human? So CRISPR is this technology where you are going into a piece of DNA and you are making a targeted change. So if you remember the story about the Chinese scientist who gene edited two twin girls probably 18 months ago, that was actually CRISPR. Now that was unauthorized CRISPR. Um, there are a number of clinical trials right now that are using CRISPR for treatments for muscular dystrophy and for hemophilia and for sickle cell anemia. And so those are all still in early clinical trial stages, but you do have patients around the world and certainly in America that are beginning to undergo CRISPR-based, gene editing-based therapies. Great question. Gary. What is the area in between in the open spaces of the molecule? The, the, the empty spaces? Yes, if it is empty space. So, so a, yeah, so, so there is some space in between the, the bases. They stack kind of almost like if you stacked a set of pennies. It's not an, it's not an enormous amount of space. It's, it's a relatively tiny space. Um, and part of what that extra space does is that if you needed to coil up the DNA, that gives you some of that, some of that space to do that. Um, but it, there isn't... Um, there's not active stuff taking place in those material, open areas. It's not physical material. No, it's not. Others, yes, and then I'll come right over here. If RNA is a duplicate of DNA, is it a transformer of disease? So RNA is a copy of DNA. It's a short term. It doesn't last long. It's degraded relatively quickly, is it, a, is it a transformer of disease? So if I have a DNA mutation, a single mutation, for example, that causes sickle cell anemia, that mutation, that change is also present in my RNA copy, and that change in my RNA copy is what means I have a protein that's produced that is different from the typical form. So DNA mutations in genes get carried into the change in RNA, which then can lead to the change in the protein structure as well. Now, we also can flip this around. Viruses, some of our viruses are DNA-based viruses. Some of our viruses don't contain DNA, they only contain RNA. So you, so you can get an infection from an RNA-based virus it infects your cells, and the very first thing it needs to do is make lots of copies of itself, so it copies itself into DNA so that it can then make lots of RNA copies and send those out. Yeah, so it hijacks your cells' natural machinery. Yeah, nature is pretty incredible. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, Charles, sorry. Yeah, so, so DNA, DNA is more than just a structural thing. It actually carries out function. And our, some of our proteins actually are motors. They are mechanical things that carry out function as well. So your lipids, your, some of your proteins, your carbohydrates are more static. They're used, we break them apart because they store energy. But some of our proteins actually carry out important functions on their own, and your DNA is both a storage tool and it is something in action as well. Um, where? Is it all chemical reactions? Some of it is chemical reactions. Some of it is actually physical movement, physical physical manipulation, physical changes, physical shifts. So some of it's chemical, some of it is not. Yes, sir? Since there's no single, uh, well, like a chromosome that has the DNA in it in the body, it's something in every single cell. When you go in and edit something like that, you are editing every cell in the body mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. So every single one of your cells contains DNA, contains your chromosomes. So when you edit, when we come back to CRISPR, when you try to edit something, can you, are you editing every single cell um, or are you only editing specific cells? So the idea for therapy is that you are only editing the cells that are causing the symptoms of your disease. So if I have a blood disorder, I don't need to edit my liver cells, I need to edit the cells in my bone marrow that are making my red blood cells that are problematic. Um, so that's, that is beneficial on the one hand, I don't have to try to edit everything, but I have to figure out how to edit the right set of tissues. So how do I home it to my bone marrow? Or how would I home it, here's a challenging one, to my brain if I'm gonna do editing for a neurodegenerative disease? How do you get that? into those cells. So that's one of the big challenges around these gene editing and gene, other gene therapies is how do you get it in the right place to do the thing that you need it to do. Now, if you edit an early embryo, which right now is a red line that we don't cross unless you are this Chinese researcher, but if you edit an early embryo, you then have a smaller number of cells to edit and all of those cells when they divide carry the edit with them but you've now edited all those cells, including the egg and sperm cells that change the next generation as well, which is a big part of why that is a red line that we don't cross. Is not the error, so to speak, in every cell? The error is in every cell, but you have, but, but in each cell type, it is using specific genes to make the proteins that that cell needs to do its job. They're, they've differentiated, yep. So even though that mutation is in every cell, the only cells that are making the protein that is in the blood, for example, are your red blood cells. Great question. Okay, so let's move on. Now here is the second place where our students do better than our adults. And this is another one where you may want to partner together and where I need you to listen all the way through for this one. So your task now is to get rid of the filter and put the filter and the rubber band in your trash bag. But hang on, hang on. <laughs> there are some tricks that you're gonna wanna do with this. Um, okay, hang on just a second. Let's see if I can, hold the mic for you. let's see if I can do that for a moment. Okay, you've got stuff on top of here, wet, liquidy stuff. If you just start pulling, you're gonna pull that over the sides and into your lap. So this is the way that you're gonna to wanna to do this. You're gonna to wanna to hold this, and don't do this yet, just watch. You're gonna to wanna to hold this at the top. You're gonna to take the rubber band and you're gonna pull down. Which direction? Down. Am I gonna pull up? No. We're gonna pull down, just like that. So I've gotten the rubber band out of the way. I am not gonna to need to tell this audience to please not flick the rubber band, please not to throw it, do not hit anybody with it. Okay, then what you need to do is you're gonna put the cup down and you're gonna gather the edges and fold it up just like this. And it's gonna drip. It's messy. And then you're going to put it into the trash bag. And at that point, you might need some paper towels. So raise your hand and we'll bring you some paper towels. But that's the process. Again, work in pairs if you want to. Pull the rubber band down, fold up the edges of the filter and stick it in the trash. Go on ahead. And you should have liquid, a small amount of liquid, varying amounts of liquid in the bottom of your cup. Well done. Nice work, everybody. Paper towel? Oh, uh, you can just leave the little tube to the side. We'll come back for it. Okay. Now, now this is my favorite part of this whole thing. 
But first, I got to tell you some science. Okay, first of all, the little plastic tube, just make sure that top's on and just set it to the side. We're going to recycle those. We'll pick those up later. So just set that to the side. Okay. Um, you have a blue container that has a lot of, a lot of purple top tubes in it. Everybody needs one of those purple top tubes. So just pass that around the two tables around you. Again, those in the center, you've got your own basket. This is really cold. Okay, so when we do this with our students, we have them guess what is in here. And they start making guesses and they often start by saying that it's water. And then we say this has been in the freezer for the last 48 hours, so it's not water. And then we ask them to think about what it might be. Is it Sprite? Is it vinegar? What could it be? At the end of the day, it's isopropyl alcohol. So it's rubbing alcohol, all right? This is not drinkable alcohol, okay? <laughs> this is not that kind of science. Um, but so this is isopropyl alcohol. And we're going to use this to make the DNA visible. Okay, here is a little bit more science. Okay, so here's our DNA structure. It's got the hydrogen bonds. Our DNA, these phosphate groups on the backbone, the yellow molecule over there, the oxygens that it's attached to have a partial negative charge. Do you remember all the way back to the first week, we talked about water and partial positives and partial negatives? So we have a whole lot of partial negatives along both sides of our DNA molecule. So it is a negatively charged molecule. It is a polar molecule. And if you remember that word that we used, polar, it has a, it has a positive, a partial positive charge, and then part of the molecule that has a partial negative charge. So that polarity, that negative charge, means that it is soluble in water. So the DNA, negatively charged, a polar molecule, your water is polar, like dissolves like, and so the DNA is soluble, you don't see it. So if you looked at this, you do not see any DNA in here. When we, in a minute, we are gonna add this cup to your container of isopropyl alcohol. The isopropyl alcohol is less polar than the water. It is not as polar. It does not have these partial positives and partial negatives. So when you add the, isopro the liquid from your strawberry extraction into the isopropyl, we're going to disrupt this polarity process. Before I tell you what happens, we're going to do it. So this is what I want you to do. You're going to take the top off of the big tube. This is the place where it's easy to spill, so just be really, really careful. You're going to take the top off, and then you're going to pour the cup into the tube. Pour the cup into the tube, and once you have poured the cup into the tube, put the top back on the tube. Again, we want to minimize the likelihood of spillage. So pour the cup in the tube, put the top back on, and then I just want you to look at what goes on in the tube and then chat with your neighbor about what you see happening. This is, for me, where the magic happens. Don't shake the tube. All right. Do you see fluffy stuff? Do you see strands? 
They may have air bubbles attached to them. They may begin to separate up and float up to the top. That fluff looks like cotton. That is DNA. Now, it's not pure DNA. It's got a whole lot of proteins attached to it. It's really, really messy. But that is the DNA that you have made visible. You have precipitated out of solution. And here's the science behind that. So I told you that when that isopropyl alcohol is less polar, it's got this less differential charge than water. So when I take the liquid that has our DNA in it and add it into the tube, two things happen. There's a little bit of salt still left over from the salt that was in our extraction buffer. And the isopropyl, the water doesn't allow this, but the isopropyl, because it's less polar, it allows the salt to bind to the negative charge on the, on the backbone of the DNA. And that binding to the negative charge neutralizes the negative charge. And so when it neutralizes the negative charge, the DNA becomes less of a polar molecule. It now becomes much more apolar, much more non-polar. And when it becomes much more nonpolar, it's no longer soluble in water. And so it becomes visible, it precipitates out. So the isopropyl allows the sodium, the salt the, the, from the sodium chloride that was in there, it allows the sodium to bind and neutralize the negative charge on the, the backbone of the DNA. And that means that now it's less polar and it no longer is water soluble and now it's visible. So now you, you can see the DNA. Now again, this DNA has lots and lots of protein. It is really messy. You would need to take this through a lot of purification in order to use this in any kind of DNA experiment. But again, the beauty of this, you have dishwashing liquid and salt and I'm willing to bet that you've got coffee filters and isopropyl alcohol at home and you've just made this molecule appear from this strawberry. I just find it fascinating. And we've now talked through our carbs, that was the cell wall that we broke apart, our lipid membrane, those were the fats that we had to break open with the soap. We had to coagulate and get rid of our proteins, and now we're left with our nucleic acid, with, th with this week's biomolecule of life. Yes. Compare this to collecting your DNA. Fortunately, we don't need to usually start out with a chunk of your body that's this big. <laughs> but that means we're gonna get a lot less DNA because we're gonna have fewer cells to work with. But if we were to give a DNA sample for a clinical or for 23andMe, for example, the same general process would happen. We would, now you don't have a cell wall that we have to break open, but we do have to, we would use a, a soap some sort of soap solution to break, to, to break open the lipids in your cells. We would separate out the cell debris from the DNA and there's a precipitation step in an alcohol that makes it visible before you then purify it and rehydrate it in water to do your experiment. So while we're not using coffee filters and dishwashing liquid, the chemical process is exactly the same. Great question. Yes. Yeah, why is it separated? So when you poured the cup, the contents of the cup into the isopropyl, there was a mixing and that mixing pulled in air. And so the DNA sticks to the, the air bubbles stick to the DNA strands and that's what has caused it to separate, to rise up to the top. If you very, very gently had poured it down the side, you would have incorporated less air and it may not have, have made that, that separation as much. Okay, so here is our last step. This is where you get to take this home, but this is also the place I want you to be careful that we don't unintentionally knock over the big vial of isopropyl. So you're gonna spool. This is where the stick comes in. You get to use the stick. DNA adheres, DNA sticks to glass and to wood. I am not giving you glass rods, um, but I'm gonna give you a wooden giant toothpick. So what you're gonna do, 
is in a minute, you're going to open up the top of the purple top tube, your isopropyl. You're gonna put the stick in. You are not gonna stir, but you are twisting the stick. I know you cannot see me twisting the stick, but you are twisting the stick this way, not stirring, and the DNA will wrap around the stick. And you'll pull the DNA out, and you will then put it into your small tube. You may need to use your fingernail to scrape it off, and if you don't want to do that, ask your neighbor to use their fingernail to scrape it off. <laughs> it is fine if some of the isopropyl alcohol ends up in the tube. In fact, that'll help preserve it. So, go ahead, unscrew the top, put the stick in, twirl it around, get the DNA out, put it in the small container, and then put the top back on the big tube so that we minimize the chance of dropping and spilling. And then this is the DNA that you get to take home. Whatever you would like to do with. You, you know, tie it around a, a string and put it on your neck. It'll last for a long time, especially if you don't touch it. I've got DNA. I've got DNA in a small vial that I've had for over a decade. Yeah. Okay, once you've done that, put that top back on your big vial of alcohol. And then you just snap the lid closed on your little container and you take your DNA with you. Okay, keeping an eye on our time, I have run us right up to our eight o'clock window. Time flies when you extract DNA. Let me do some quick housekeeping to make the cleanup easier on my team. I'm not gonna ask you to take any of this. You take the little vial of DNA home if you'd like. We'll take care of all the cleanup, but here's what I'd like you to do. Just set the cup to the side. We will collect the cup, the rest of the trash in the big bag, and then set the small tube and the big tube to the side, and we'll pick all of that up. So essentially all your trash, the stick, the rubber band, the coffee filter, all that goes in the big bag. Leave your cup to the side and leave the two tubes to the side, and we'll take care of the rest, and you take the little DNA home. Okay, as you're doing that, I want to say a word of thanks because you have now spent four nights with me. You've spent six hours talking about biochemistry. And that is not something that we enter into lightly. And I know we've done it with costumes and we've talked about history, but we've done some significant science. And I want to thank you for being willing to engage in that with me. Just as a reminder, Here's everything we covered, and all the costumes as well. So we started. We talked about lipids, about these carbon hydrogen chains. We talked about the difference between our solids. Y'all, this is on your handout too. So if you, if you can take a picture of your hand. You can take a picture of the screen, but it's also on your handout if you want to take a picture of that too. Um, so we talked about the difference between lipids that are oils at room temperature versus lipids that are solid at room temperature. And we did all that tasting of our butters and our margarines and spreads. Then we talked about proteins made up of amino acids. Those are the key building blocks. And we talked about silk and wool, and we talked about all the different proteins that are present in the human body. Last week we talked about carbs, about these sugars. Simple sugars like glucose, more complex sugars like sucrose, where two sugars are put together, and then really complicated long strings of sugar that are stored either as starch or glycogen for quick energy, or are stored as cellulose to provide structure and rigidity to plant cells. And then tonight we brought it home with talking about nucleic acids, 
your DNA and your RNA that provide the instructions that tell your bodies how to assemble the amino acids that you make your proteins with. Life is incredible. Life is beautiful. Life is made up, by and large, of these four things. Lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Those are the key biomolecules. You've also just walked your way through probably the first three weeks of an undergraduate biology class. Um, I cannot award you college credit for that, but we've covered that key content. Um, I just want to say thank you. You've been willing to do something very different from the way that we've done biotech in years past, and I appreciate you stepping into that. The goal was to create something that was more collaborative and less of me just standing up and lecturing, and I appreciate you being willing to go there with me. So with that, and with one final word of thanks to my team for making all of this a reality. <laughs> Helen and Anna, we, we count you guys as part of the team because you were here every week working on all this stuff as well. So thank you very much. Even though you're not education, we thank you for allowing advancement to borrow, to let us borrow you. Thank you all. Um, with that, I will wish you good night and thank you for being with us and I will see you again next year for 201. Have a good night everybody.